panel discussion is highlights from the field, transforming lives and minds. AFJN, alongside African partners, leads efforts for structural change and community empowerment. Listen to highlights from our partners in Ghana, Cameroon, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda. Sister Eukarya Madweke, I apologize, sister, if I am not pronouncing it properly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sister Mary Lily, Sister Bernadette, I think, I think we need to. Oh, Sister Bernadette, you're online. Nice, okay. Yeah, Bernadette online. And Ntama Bahati, I'm calling the names for those since it's a recorded thing. I'll call your name and do the due diligence so those who are listening can get context. Okay. It's Massa Faransid and Honorable Juliana Pedekpo, Chief Executive, Direct Chief Executive, Adaklu District. So again, the conversation will be highlights from the field, transforming lives and minds. Good afternoon, everyone. And Good thank afternoon. you. Uh, taking this time to come and uh, celebrate with us. Africa Faith and Justice Network has projects in Africa. And we have partners with whom we journey. During the first panel, you also heard that it was important for those stakeholders to be at the table. And that is what we have done in going to Africa and the beneficiaries of our programs. And I would like to invite um, Juliana, who is uh, the chief executive uh, of uh, the Adaklu district in Ghana to kick off this conversation and simply answering the question, uh, what, um, what uh, has Evgen done and what has been the impact? As you, you heard, I am Bahati. I am uh, the policy analyst and coordinate the Just Governance Program of Africa Faith and Justice Network. I'd like to give the microphone to Sister Eukarya to introduce the uh, Women Empowerment Program. Sister Eukarya. Hello, everyone. I am Sister Eukarya Madweke. And I coordinate the Women Empowerment Project of uh, Africa Faith and Justice Network. Since um, seven years ago, Africa Faith and Justice Network has been working with um, Catholic women, uh, Catholic sisters in Africa to provide a platform for them to do advocacy. And it has been a, a great experience working with the sisters. And as we work with the sisters, one of the things we do with the sisters is to focus, refocus them again on the Catholic social teachings. You know, when we talk about um, Africa Faith and Justice Network, we are focusing on the faith of um, our own faith as expressed in the Catholic social teachings. So working with the sisters, they have also, we're not just working with the sisters alone. The sisters also have incorporated working with the, working with them um, youth. So I'm going to call the sisters on them because they're not able to travel here. So they have been able to, they're going to be able to talk to us through the Zoom. So I, we call Sister Lily from uh, Uganda. So that sister will be able to let tell us what they have been doing in Uganda. The sisters that are represented on the um, on the Zoom is not all the sisters we work with, or the countries. We are in uh, six countries, but we're able to get just two countries to so just give us a highlight of what they have been doing. So, sister Lily, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, um, Sister Eukaria, for inviting me. Uh, I would like to congratulate Africa Faith and Justice Network 
for making this milestone. I also want to appreciate all of you, the stakeholders of Africa Faith and Justice Network. Yeah, since it, uh, the inception of Africa Faith and Justice Network in Uganda, we have gone through a lot of challenges and we have also created impact and we have also a reason to celebrate today with Africa Faith and Justice Network celebrating these 40 years. From the time we met Africa Faith and Justice Network in 2018, we have never been the same because we involved in advocacy. And in involving in advocacy, we have been able to interface with different stakeholders, especially the government of Uganda. We have been able to go to different ministries, to go even as far as the parliament, to ask the why, why this, why, especially why trafficking in person is taking, because uh, why trafficking in person is taking place, because Africa Faith and Justice Network made us to identify a lot of social issues in the, in the society, like uh, land wrangling, land grabbing, early child marriage, child abuse, domestic violence. But out of this many, we have been able to tackle the issue of early child marriage and even school dropout and advocate for school retention among girls, especially in the northern region of Uganda. But in a very special way, we have dwelt so much on trafficking, on the theme trafficking in persons. So we have been able to interface with the government the different ministries, especially the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, which is responsible for uh, uh, recruitment, for promoting the recruitment agencies to let the youth leave the country in search of external labor or support the externalization of labor. So we are being able to in the last seven years, we were able to bring together 110 stakeholders of different levels to discuss this issue, to bring this issue to their attention, and with the intention of influencing the policy. And then we have also been able to bring Uganda Episcopal Conference on board, and because of the advocacy we made, they were able to come up with this book, a pastoral letter on trafficking in persons entitled Break the Yoke. And apart from the pastoral letter, we have been able to organize annual prayer. We call the nation to attention with different religions. In the, it is interdenominational nature. We organize national prayer to remember the victims and survivors of human trafficking and even pray for the conversion of the perpetrators. Because of that, the government is able also now to join us in prosecution of the perpetrators of, of the trafficking in persons. They are able to give protection to the victims and even join us in carrying prevention of the victims of human trafficking, and we are able to enter partnership with them. And the Ministry of Internal Affairs is able now, they have a database to gather information about trafficking in persons and even able to give us report about the state of trafficking in persons. For instance, it was recorded that in the year 2022, that's last year, they registered over 2,999 victims of traffic, uh, trafficking in Uganda. And they are also able to self-critique themselves because mm -hmm. out of 348 cases which were reported in court, only 12 cases 
we are convicted and then one was dismissed. So it means only uh, 3.7% cases were resolved last year. And we are happy that they were able to take the challenge and self-critique themselves. And then on a positive note, this year, uh, our guest of honor from the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development in the national prayer was able to also share with us the fact that last year, that is 2022, there were 720 alleged trafficked persons who were prosecuted last year alone went to that level, meaning out of the awareness we have created, they have been able to take legal uh, procedures in handling cases of the, uh, of the perpetrators. But unfortunately, out of 720, there were only 589 who were prosecuted or recorded or uh, rec yeah, recorded in 2029. So it means now there's an increase of recordings or uh, reporting cases uh, or on, on trafficking in persons. And this year, with the help of Africa Faith and Justice Network, we are also able to tackle um, internal or domestic trafficking in persons. For many of you who might know, Karamoja region is the most affected. For those of you who have been able to reach Kampala, you will see that we have these children from Karamoja who are brought in and subject to begging on the streets. And many of them die in the process of begging on the streets because they are knocked by motorcycles or by vehicles. And then others are abused sexually and... Uh, they also drop out of school. So with the help of Africa Faith and Justice Network, we have been able to go to the roots. We had meeting with the elders in Karamoja to find out why this is happening. And we came to realize that according to the culture of the Karamojong, children are supposed to faint uh, for the parents. So we kind of challenged them and told them to give children their rights. And then we also got people to give a presentation on human rights. And uh, we were able to meet different stakeholders apart from the elders because uh, the stakeholders from the government side, the local government, the high level government, and even the hon honorable ministers and the members of parliament were present. And we are able to write advocacy letter which we are going to make follow up to make sure these children have school and even if possible introduce feeding program in this school so that this, the retentionship is in place. And then we Mr. have Lynn, been able we'll come back to, yes. Mr. Lynn, we'll come back to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Sister Lily is yeah. Sister Lily is calling the activity of um, AFJN in Uganda. So we thank you. We come back to you. Thank you, sister. <laughs> so Sister Benedette Okure is uh, also coordinating the activities of uh, AFJN in Nigeria. So yes. Sister Benedette, can we hear from you? Yes, thank you. And thank you to my sister from Uganda and Greetings to all of you stakeholders of AJ. I have been privileged to be part of the Africa Faith and Justice Network activities in Nigeria from its beginning in 2016. Since then, AFJN has achieved great landmarks in different areas, including policy changes at the local and state level and mobilizing the people to work for systemic change. So I bring the voices of so many Nigerians in this one voice to try and express our encounter with FJS. Our first gathering focused on the introduction of GMO seeds in Nigeria 
with the so-called Nigeria Bisexy, Bisexy Act. Some politicians collaborated with Monsanto, snaked a deal at the national level that allowed Monsanto to genetically modify basic stable crops in Nigeria. Our gathering brought together government officials, heads of farmers' organizations, physicians, and experts in the field to highlight the implication of GMO to local farmers, to the health of the people, and seed monopoly. The result was that the Senate summoned the Minister of Agri to explain how the law was passed without most of them knowing it. This did not stop the process right away, but it allows, it slowed it down. It created awareness such that many people refrain from using GMO seeds. Our next target was a gathering of Catholic sisters at Abuja, Nigeria capital, to discuss issues that we can tackle as women religious. We were 87 sisters from 28 congregations. As part of the workshop, we held practical advocacy at the National Assembly on issues affecting women and children at the, at, at the National Police Headquarters on security issues. Following this gathering, we held another meeting where we identified human trafficking as an issue as a burning issue to address. On one state was notorious for human trafficking in Nigeria. Over a period of 18 months, we engaged the state on a comprehensive bottom-up approach. We went to communities, schools, held town hall meetings to listen to the people and created awareness on how this issue was destructive to the victims and to the communities. We engage associations such as Market Women Association, religious leaders, and youth groups. Emmanuel will talk more about that when we, we, we will come in. The sensitization program gained traction within the community. From there, we went to the top level gov governance the state governor, the state commissioner of police, the minister of youth, the attorney general, and the paramount king of the region. As a result of our sensitization program, four significant things happened. Number one, a notorious brothel was, which was used as a transit for trafficking girls was shut down. Once we did that, the chief of the town had the courage to issue a decree banning people of the town from selling to buying from or interact with of the brother. The person who, for many years, seemed untouchable was eventually expelled from the town. Along the government number two, the governor of the state introduced anti trafficking to the state assembly. It passed. It was a very strict law that gives the attorney general the power to arrest, prosecute traffickers, and where applicable, confiscate the property of the traffickers. Doesn't arrested and prosecuted. Number three. The Paramount King, the Oba of Benin, issued an injunction against traditional herbalists who assist traffickers, including the cost of the ancestors on them if they continue to assist traffickers. Number four, the result is a drastic reduction in trafficking in the state. It is estimated that trafficking has dropped by 70%. In Enugu State, we conducted advocacy on the rights of the child, promoting the governor of the state to establish 13 child protective courts throughout the state. A trend 
we trained groups of youth and managed, mentored them on advocacy. In this way, Emmanuel will say more about that. They continue to be active. One group in particular is very active and has built a coalition between Christian and Muslim youth to tackle the issue of child marriage. Presently, we are focusing on domestic servitude and child marriage and are building a coalition to tackle these issues. You know, these issues are actually interrelated. Once they are finished one and then go on to the other. Something we have learned in the process is the effectiveness of building coalition to tackle a problem. If you don't go alone, it's not good enough. You need to build a coalition. And it has worked. Thanks to the training we received from AFJN. Long live AFJN. <laughs> Amen. Thank, thank you. you. Sister Benny, thank you so much. We'll come back to you. So can we, you. um, Emmanuel is, um, as I said, um, we have also expanded our engagement of the sisters to the youth. So Emmanuel is going to talk to us what the youth group is doing. Emmanuel. Okay. Hello, everyone. And, um, Say congratulations once more to AFJN on this uh, very special occasion of our 40th anniversary. So greetings from Nigeria and from AFJN youths here in Nigeria, particularly for those of us in just province. So um, like Sister Benedict mentioned and Sister Jukeria, I am parts myself and other youth groups, other, other members of the youth are part of uh, the AFJN youth. And then I think two, three years ago, we were among the beneficiaries of uh, AFJN training that was coordinated by Sister Ukarian, Sister Benny, and the rest of the sisters. And then in Abuja, and then a few of us were trained particularly on the importance of advocacy in tackling social issues, particularly within our community, and then the need for us to get involved as young people in tackling some of these um, social ills in our community. And um, since that uh, training, I think two years ago in Abuja, three years ago, we we as AFJ and youth, particularly in just province, we thought to ourselves what we could do to continue this uh, message that and the, this impact that we've received from the AFGN and then under the mentorship of the sisters, particularly Sister Benny, our national coordinator, and then Sister Ukiria, who have also been very much involved, and Sister Teresa Tanko, our head here in Jos province, we were able to, we thought during the 2019 governorship elections in Plateau State, we, we, we asked what we could do because Plateau State is known to be very volatile. And then mostly during elections, there is always issues of um, religious or ethnic violence or clashes. So we thought what we could do as young people, having received this training from AFGN. So we were able to carry out advocacy visitor campaigns, particularly through the social media. To, to talk to our fellow young people on the need to shy away from electoral violence. And we did a short video to that effect, which was, um, I think we, sh we shared it on all social media platforms and we made sure that it went around. And to the glory of God, after that election, it was, there was no recorded, uh, violence, unlike what we used to have normally in Plateau State. And I want to believe our little efforts through the support of AFGN, also contributed towards that peaceful elections in Plateau State. And also after that, we, we also thought what we could do again, looking at our society, particularly in this part of the country, we thought there is the issue, we, we observe there is rising cases of drug abuse, and like Sister Benny mentioned, domestic servitude and early child marriage. So we, we, in collaboration, in the spirit of partnership the AFGN is known for, with the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, NAPTIP, 
and the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency here in Plateau State. We were able to mobilize and come together in partnership with other religious bodies too, to be able to advocate. We went around, we visited communities, about four communities within this region, to be able to advocate and talk to our fellow young people, particularly on the dangers of drug abuse and the implications too of early child marriage, because we observed some persons, it is um, out of poverty, out of illiteracy, that they are able to, that they are involved in some of these things. So we, we spoke to our fully young people and then to the parents and then we visited community leaders also to talk to them on the, on the need to, to, to see that the issue of um, drug abuse, the issue of early child marriage and the issue of domestic servitude is, is brought to the barest minimum, if not entirely eradicated within our community. And it was a huge success. And then in continuation with that same advocacy, we observed after that, that there is, um, there is this high level of particularly early child marriage within the northern region of the country. And, and we observed that because in Nigeria, the, the country somehow is divided along religious lines. Uh, the, the north is mostly Muslim country, Muslim faith, and then we we'll have more of the Christians in the south. So since we are based in the north, we observed that this high case of um, early child marriage is somewhat uh, related to culture and then more so religion because I think for them in Islam, there is no, there's, there, there's, they don't so much um, see the dangers of early child marriage. They don't see it as, a, as an issue for them. So we thought of the need of collaborating, bringing, to, bringing together these two faiths, the Christians and the Muslims together to talk on this issue beyond religious, to look at it beyond religious uh, view or from beyond the religious point of view or cultural point of view, and to look at the implications of this, of early child marriage, particularly on the girl child and how, it's able, how, it's, how it negatively affects society. So to the glory of God, we were able to come together this year, we were able to bring together Christians and Muslims were over 100 in number and we sat together and we spoke about this issue and it was a huge success we were able to come to an understanding that this is just this is beyond the religious issue this is beyond cultural issue but it is affecting society generally and it was it was hugely hugely successful and we are continuing in that advocacy after that we've had a follow-up visit and i fact on their own they are they are they are continuing this um the message they are spreading the message within their own community within the i mean they are within the muslim community now although it's not limited to the muslim community but like i said earlier we observed it is more prevalent because it's because of cultural and religious issues also so it's been with, with that huge collaboration which is not always easy because just because of the volatile nature there is always this um, this agreement between the Christians and the Muslims, or not so, not so. There's no the peace is very unstable. So we find this something really, really, really huge for us to be able to achieve as um, AFJ and youth, and we are continuing with that collaboration because now we have partners that are beyond religious, now, not just Christian youth or AFJ and youth or Catholic youth, but we also have even Muslim youth or Muslim persons involved in this advocacy and the campaign against particularly early child marriage and domestic servitude in this part of the country. And then also in line with that, we are continuing also to build this same synergy. We are looking at, by the grace of God, having what we have, what we call the youth club, whereby um, these youth, as we've had this relationship, we've established this contact with them, we will continue to build this synergy. The youth club is, 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 is just an informal gathering of young people where we come to talk about social ills across religious lines, across ethnic lines. And then we have our informal activities together and then we plan for programs together as young people, not as Christian youths, not as Muslim youths, not as a um, particular religion, a particular tribe, but as young people. So it is, it's, it is a program that it is still ongoing. We are still planning, trying to, how to implement it. But these are some of the few um, um, challenge, uh, I think successes that we've been able to record as youths of AFJN. And then we are still continuing with this same advocacy, this same building of bridge, because we believe 
at the end of the day, whatever affects society affects all of us, not as Christian youths, not as Muslim youths, not as a particular section of the country, but it affects all of us as a people. So we're continuing this networking, this bridge building, and this advocacy, particularly among the youths. Thank you, and then congratulations once more to AFGN. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. That was good. So I now hand over to Bahati. All right. As I said before, I am the coordinator of our Just Governance program. And part of this program, we, are, we have a campaign on land grabbing. This, programs, this program aims at uh, fighting the agro-colonialism that is taking root on the continent of Africa. Whereas large multinationals are going to Africa acquiring lands for practically less or almost nothing for long terms, 90 years, 50 years, and 70 years, and so on. The consequences are major and the threat to Africa's national security, food security is immense. So for quite some time, for, since 2014, we have been going to Ghana to bring this uh, awareness to the communities. Like itinerant preachers, we go village by village, village by village. And um, last month, uh, Stephen and myself, we were in Adaklu and uh, Miss Juliana is the one who organized uh, our meetings over there. Once again, uh, Juliana is uh, uh, the chief executive for the, um, the Adaklu district, and she was able to help us bring the message to her people. And we appreciate your time. Please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bahati. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be a part of this celebration and congratulations to you, AFJN on your 40th anniversary. We wish you many more years. Well, my name is Juliana Pedepo, as Bahati had already mentioned, District Chief Executive for Andaklu District, as in, uh, I think is known here as mayor or of a county, actually. Yeah. So, and I happen to be the first female district executive for that district. <laughs> so, I must say it hasn't been easy, but by the grace of God, we are pulling through. And now, of course, I'm also still aspiring to go higher, to become a member of parliament for the same district. So, once I win my elections, pray for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, when I met uh, African Faith and Justice Network through Mama Alovi, who is one of the Queen Mothers in the Volta region of Ghana, um, she connected me to the Bahati's team. I was in the office and then they pay a, a casting call on me in that district. And I thought it was just one of, you know, Thing, we come, we discuss, and we don't hear anything again from them. But to my surprise, he's always been in touch with us in the district. And just as he said, uh, last month, they came with uh, himself, Stephen, and then some sisters. I mean, a good team of them. We're so happy to help them. And of course, my district, when you come, we have uh, a vast land. And uh, it's a home for... I mean, one of the beautiful mountains in Ghana, we call it Adaklu Mountain. And then it's also a hub for organic honey, that is if you want one. So when I met them, I actually discussed our problems with them because we had land, but uh, development wasn't so much, you know, up to where we wanted to be. Due to poverty, I would say, families are forced to give away lands that they own just like at almost nothing. Yes, when I confront or contacted them on the issue, they said, well, it's not wrong to have investors come in your, I mean, your area to help develop the 
place for you. But it depends on the motive of which they are there. Are they really there to help us? Or they, they are just to grab our lands and then tomorrow, uh, the generation after us will come and suffer. So I got some insight from them. And Quicklaw said, okay, I was going to organize uh, the opinion leaders, stakeholders in the district so that we'll meet with them. So this message gets down to them. It's not just about what you are getting at the moment when you are giving out those lands. It is about tomorrow, the future, and then what will benefit the next generation as well. So we organized um, an engagement with the traditional authorities. Uh, we met with the paramount chief who, I mean, are placed, those are traditional leaders and they have, I mean, they are key when it comes to land issues. They own the lands. So I organized a meeting with them. We met with them in the palace of the chief and Bahati and the team gave out the message. Initially, I mean, it didn't really go down well with the paramount chief. I think Steve can explain more. <laughs> But initially, getting to the end of it, they understood that, okay, so they had always, I mean, they're doing the wrong thing or doing things the wrong way. Um, but when it comes to giving out lands, that they have to give it out, but also keep in mind that there is tomorrow. So that today, you don't give out everything just at almost nothing. Because you are hungry right now, and then you forget that tomorrow your generations will continue and also need that same land to live on. And when you come to Adaklu, agriculture is the main thing there. So where will the next generation come and then also do their steps? So eventually they understood. And then we, from there, we went to some of the communities as well. We had community engagement, some women groups as well. We met with them and... The issues were laid bare. I mean, they asked questions where they needed explanations and all that. They got the insights of the whole thing. And this day, I can confidently say that uh, the feedback has been positive now. And I'm sure no one in Adakru districts will just wake up one day and give out acres. I mean, hundreds of thousands of acres of land just like that after meeting with AFJN and getting the insights of the message. From there, we also met with um, uh, key stakeholders of the assembly who represent their various communities when it comes to the general assembly in the district of which I am heading. And there uh, was to build their capacity so that they can also pass on the information to the base. I mean, ours is a local government issue so that the message gets to the last person down there so that wouldn't be like it is we those at the top that just have it. No, we want it to get to everyone. So they are more or less now advocates who will be spreading their issues. And I was happy when Bahati said that most of them has even gotten back to him as to how far they've gone so far in organizing their, I mean, community engagement and sensitizing the people. So for me, African Faith and Justice Network, I think this is just the beginning for us in Adaklu, and we're still looking forward to you know doing more and probably in the next uh 40th celebration i'll come back as an old woman i'm sure <laughs> and so be part of it and uh i just want to thank you so much for the opportunity this has helped us to build the capacity especially of the assembly members giving them that international platform you know they are so happy with it. And myself as the district chief executive, I just want to stand on behalf of the uh, whole assembly and say a very big thank you to AFJ and God bless you for the good work. All right. Thank you so much. And we look forward to partnering with you even more. Uh, under the Just Governance program, uh, we look at the cancer of corruption. When Aniedi uh, was leading FJN, he asked this question. Yes, we, the church, we give injunctions to leaders about corruption in the institutions and are our institutions free of corruption. And so he said, we, 
to establish that moral authority, to speak truth to power, we need also to look inside and organize within the church and see where we can we can eradicate some malpractice. And so we set out to do a pilot program with the Diocese of Bafusam, looking at ways to eradicate corruption within the diocesan institutions, schools, hospitals, other, other uh, social programs. So I invite Madame Massa, who is the coordinator of uh, Africa Faith and Justice Network Cameroon, and with whom we worked as the coordinator of the Justice and Peace of the Diocese of Cameroon to give you a briefing on what the pilot program has produced. Madam Massa, you have the floor. Uh, you have seven minutes uh, to make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bati. Um, Madam Massa, as you say, the national coordinator, Africa Faith and Justice Network, Cameroon. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, since 2019, that we start collaborating with Africa Faith and Justice Network. And the main uh, issue that we, we decided to go through is the corruption. Indeed, we are talking about the corruption in the national level, but at the level of our institution like the church, which are supposed to be references. This is why we deemed it necessary to work to eradicate all corruption practice in order to clean up our environment as church before giving injunction to the state. So we organized awareness rising at schools, health centers, and in many other social works in the diocese of Bafusam. It is clear that there were practice of corruption by the staff. For example, someone in these services at arrived around 9 a.m. occupies the corresponding rank or place itself at 12 p.m., while someone who arrived at 11 a.m. is self thanks to the manoeuvre of the staff having receiving motivation or a package. Is those is those exist other corruption practices such as the creation of false schools report cards to facilitate the registration of children in another reputable establishment in the in exchange for a sum of money. The illicit state of med medicines by nurse and head of health centers. Through the awareness rising in the Fosan Health Center. The entire staff team of this health center resigned after uh, an educate, uh, educational talk. The members of the new team put in place have much more integrity. Through the awareness rising in the Fossa Health Center, as I'm saying, the entire team of the health center resigned. The, the chain of the establishment of birth certificates is uh, wriggling with corrupt, practice, pra with corrupt practices. So after having supported the population of the municipalities of MIFI, which allow more than 20,000 children to have their birth certificate. Since 2019, we have been operating in the noon, in the noon department of the Western region of Cameroon. Thus, we have made a commitment to popularize not only the law linked to the procedure, but also to raise awareness among the populations on the importance of the birth certificate in the life of every Cameroonian citizen. To support the population in the procedure of mobile court, in summary, the table below gives over overall view of all the activities carried out. 
We have organized for awareness of development services, design products, we product also the design awareness tools and awareness rising on health center in 21 uh, health centers. We participate in meeting with the families and clubs of culture of peace. We do it in 20, uh, during the 20, uh, 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 meeting with the families and the clubs of justice and of the, with the, in the association of parents and school children and the teacher, we have organized aware, <clears throat> awareness in 27 meeting with the parents and teachers and schools. We organized also two mobile courts who uh, at the end, we established 278 bed certificates who are already established in, in, this, in this village. And uh, the second mobile, mobile court is already organized. And we are in the process of establish 301 birth certificates uh, to the children of this uh, new division. What we are doing now as a coordinator National Coordinator just and, uh, Africa Faith and Justin Network is to legalize officially the document who is now in the process. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Right. Thank you, Madam Massa. Um, I have to footnote uh, the uh, her speech by saying that uh, uh, if you don't have a birth certificate, practically you are stateless and you can't uh, have a passport. You can't go to higher education and much more. So yes. um, we would like to have questions uh, from the floor and from online so we can get uh, some engagement going. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Father Sane. I'm a Jesuit. And I would like just to congratulate AFGN for this uh, great anniversary. It's a wonderful work you have been doing. And this is exactly uh, what I would call the... Uh, the enacting of uh, the Catholic social teaching uh, in uh, concrete and pragmatic ways. So congratulations for what you did for, for women and what you will do certainly in the future. But I would like to know how do you, uh, in both sides, for women and also for the land grab, how do you work with uh, lawyers to, uh, uh, to really enforce uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, prevention of uh, uh, grabbing lands and also uh, pulling women uh, back uh, regarding their rights. Because it's interesting to work with uh, local people, but for sure, if uh, uh, there is a, a need for uh, consistency, it's... Uh, indispensable to uh, work with uh, uh, lawyers and uh, make sure it will uh, last longer. For Women Empowerment Project, the, you know, the essence of Women Empowerment Project is to empower the sisters so that they will empower others. So we're not just only empowering the sisters, but we felt that these are the group of women that we know that right from onset, they have been there, you know, doing a lot of charity. So in them, among the, the sisters, we have many sisters that are lawyers and they are members of AFJN. So when it comes to any legal issue, they take over. So Sister Juliet was actually going to talk to us, but she has, um, she's doing an exam because she is uh, also doing ca um, canon law. She's also, a she's a civil lawyer. So most of the, cases we have had on women issue. I remember one woman in Nigeria, who, you know, the husband always beating her, telling her she has nobody, she is nobody because she is an orphan. Do let pick the issue up with the, with the, uh, the sisters. But so we also have um, another a, a lay woman that is with AFJN, very powerful woman, Amaka, Barista Amaka. So anytime we have issue, 
this lawyer speak up, you know, that is a, a kind of a, we need a lawyer advice. They just speak up. I don't know if. Um... Well, thank you. For me, I mean, uh, as a district, we also have um, lawyers that we work with. Every assembly in Ghana actually has a state lawyer attached to the assembly. So any legal issues at all. I mean, that is handled by the assembly. Then, of course, when it comes to uh, the women issues, because me being a, a leader or a female leader, now women are, can feel free to actually express themselves how they feel and uh, what they want done. And of course, once the issues get to me, for me, you can be rest assured that I will also get to the bottom of it as the head. If it means to involve security, we do that. The councils, we do that. So that is what, I mean, at the district level happens in Ghana. Uh, when we do radio shows, live radio, radio shows, you hear a lot of people, oh, I just, uh, what you're explaining, it's what just happened to me. I list the land. Can you help me get, the, get it back? The answer is, how much money do you have? The company have more money than you do. And... You just made a bad decision. But uh, there is the first company, the first community we, we worked with, they were able, actually their contract on page 37 says, in case of a disagreement between the company, it was an American company, and the, the, the landowners, they had to go to Paris for arbitration. It's written there, page 37. And through our advocacy, they were able to push forward. But because we were fighting them in Cameroon, they got bankrupt. They weren't able to pay what they promised to people in Ghana. And they were obliged to sell to a British company. And then it was there that we asked the British company to sit down with the community and review the, uh, the lease that they had. Uh, inherited. So, um, uh, Madam Massa um, works with the legal committee. Madam Massa, can you answer the question, please, quickly? Mm. It's also true that my English is not perfect, but if you can summarize, please, I will try to come up with it. Yeah, if the not, question was, um, how do um, how do we make sure people are held accountable? And um, they, that people get legal assistance um, in uh, in what we do. Thank you. Yes, uh, according to the law here in Cameroon, when there is a situation like that, looking at the law practice in Cameroon. We have two possibility. The first possibility is to uh, do the interpolation to the other side and to try to explain what is going on by the law who is practiced. The second possibility is to do the follow up, juridical follow up near the population and let them to, you can write a document to the, the the chief of the appeal court to inform him and also to the general advocate to the appeal court. The experience that we made on that side was the experience with the children that was in the in the jail. And during the court, the procedure, they were condemned of 18, 18 months. But after 24 months, those six years was not buried. When we arrived to the prison, we discovered that the, those six young people was there and just teasing. That is why we run back to the court and give the information to the, the, the president of appeal court and immediately there was buried. So all is here in Cameroon. What we do is to focus our intervention around the law who is practiced and also 
to to let the population understand and knowing very well the context of application of uh, of the law. That is why I can say. Um, any other question? Hello. Uh, yes, uh, Faustine. Just want to give a big thanks, especially to FJ and partners and uh, uh, members, especially those voices from the field, just from the day-to-day -day engagement. I can only imagine what it takes um, for somebody like you, Juliana, to be on this constant engagement, convince the people, including the elders, and helping them shift course. My question is both to our, you know, members in the field and to all of us here, staff, board, and everybody, just given the opportunities pre presented as AFJN is building um, infrastructure to engage at the various levels, and I think we are definitely, obviously we are seeing policy change happening. But the other part of advocacy that I wonder if this is the time to engage on is the budget piece. Um, because a lot of times, just from any of the projects that's been mentioned, when we have these children that are rescued, there's very little resources associated with helping rehabilitate or offer services. And so, I'm asking myself sitting here, is it time for us to also think about budget advocacy, really getting in to understand what the various structures of government allocate? It could be depending on the country, of course, the region. What's the allocation of the, the, the state agency to these various issues? The state has a contract with its people to provide those services, both in policy and budget. And I wonder if this is an area we want to go deeper in or if there's already some engagement in that space. I would just be curious to hear what that looks like. And there are tools out there. If, if we haven't done enough, I think it might be worth beginning to get into um, because it's hard to see how we sustain this going forward when we don't know if our legislators even prioritize these issues in the budget. And the excuse that will always come up is we can't do anything because we don't have the money, but where is the money? Yeah, uh, again, uh, we look at the, the affected people tell us what their priorities are and we follow their lead. Certainly when they bring up this issue of funding, um, uh, when we have the means, definitely we will we accompany them on the journey of advocacy for um, budget for the interest of their dis different districts and so on. So we are more than ready. We know now what to do. Mm. You know, I think um, one first thing you're saying is uh, a big challenge that we face, the sustainability of this project. Mm, of, most often, they, we're able to gather the sisters, do the travel, because it's not just about um, doing the advocacy. There's a lot of travel to be made. There's uh, logistics that needs finances. And many a time, if we're not there, I don't see how they're going to pick it up, because advocacy is not the interest of our, our government. There is no funding allocated for that. So we will continue to, I think it's a big struggle. Sometimes we, the sisters come because, you know, they have the, the interest, but they don't have the money to do the travels. They don't have the money. If we're going to a far place, we have to find accommodation and feeding. They don't really have the money. So it's something we, we continue to struggle. And, you know, we really thank those people, communities, Holy Child, SND, White Fathers, all, that, all the people that have given us money to do this. Because we know that without that, it may have, it may be a, a kind of a difficult. Advocacy is not something that uses money. It's very difficult for you to even to report because this is when you are trying to do the change of mindset. 
So many a time, it's not like uh, you are giving, oh, we changed 20 policy. It takes time to do this. It takes about. So reporting it, it doesn't attract funding. So we just keep seeing how it is going to be sustained. There are two questions online. Um, maybe we can start with Sister Mary. Sister Mary Lilly, if you could unmute yourself and show yourself and you can ask your question online. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I just would like to add my voice to the question uh, which was raised about sustainability, about how to help these children who are rescued. Yeah, there's immense need to support these people. Uh, as Sister Eukarya mentioned, there is no budget allocation. But we have also discovered that if someone like on the side of the government is willing to help, it means your hands will be tied. It's like they have, they may have some strings attached, in other words, to say, stop what you are doing, or uh, as you do this, they will remind you how much they have helped you. In other words, they will compromise with you. So it's a very uh, difficult situation to handle. It needs a lot of keenness. It needs a lot of uh, care to address. Thank you. Um, this is 40 years anniversary for AFJ. And I'm wondering, um, in your 40 years, you are not been able to attract some businesses in Africa to support this network? Is there... I, I don't know. Did you try and fail? Or are you telling me that there are no interested businesses that can help support your uh, advocacy in Africa? No businesses that are interested in similar uh, projects like you are taking on that could support? You understand my question? Yeah, you asking um, whether we haven't had financial support from Africa or why have yes, we? Yes, have, have you had or if, if if you have had, tell us about that and if not, why not? Um, well, we, we have survived. We have actually, we flourished for 40 years in terms of impact in Africa. Uh, maybe less in terms of financial contribution from the organizations. Um, I think as Sister Ukeria rightly said, it's not just in Africa. Advocacy is not necessarily one of the things that you usually get money to do, even here in Washington, D.C. Um, because what you do with advocacy is you challenge the structure that gives you the money. Now, I don't know. Um, so often it's not an easy thing to do. So we work with the U.S. federal government the legislation, the executive branch, we have cordial relationships on mutual interests. Now, it doesn't mean we don't disagree. Um, so we work on the things that we agree on to change the structures. Now, we do have support. That's why we're here 40 years. 90% of that support comes from this room. In, the, in all these organizations, these congregations, these men and women, some of them who stood there, so sat there today, because they had believed in. And one of the things I wanted you to understand is, you know, when you saw Father 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 Roku sitting there, Sister Mora sitting there, Father Julian and Father Bill Headley, and that was so many years ago and a lot of transitions in terms of buying into this. And that's why you have, for instance, myself as an African heading this organization and majority of the people working here. And this is an organic um, transition in terms of understanding that this is good for Africa. Now, the men and women you saw there, and I was in Ghana and I was in Uganda just this month, or I think last month, many of them, almost none of them gets paid to do this work. But they take up their time, they go to these villages, many of them are nuns, and some of them are just public workers, and they are vested into it. And what we have seen is a change from the bottom in which, you know, talking about um, social contracts, 
some of them have started redefining what social contract means for their countries. So for instance, a social contract in a place like where I come from in Sierra Leone is, for instance, if you come to my place, you want me to vote for you, I am assuming you're not going to do anything for my place. So give me a bag of rice now while I still have my vote. And if you win and you don't give me anything, I'm good. We understood each other. I get my whatever I want. I give you my vote. You're gone. Now, it's not because I don't want you to do much, but it's because I know there's very little you can do. There's, I mean, you know. But that social contract has been redefined to hold public officials, starting from the local government, such as what um, Honorable Juliana is doing there, up to the national level, to see some of these things. What we do is to make those powers uncomfortable by giving power to the people that it belongs to in terms of education. So when they get educated, they write letters, they go to their local councils, they make it uncomfortable. And i give you one last example. We just came from Ghana, where we went to this town, which was called, I think it's, it's not other club, but it's another town, um, um, I forgot the name of the city anyway. So a, com a company went there and bought the whole land, and it's a distillery farm um, company, and they are brewing wine. Now they bought so much of the land that even the water source, where these people drink water, the running water, where they drink the Londa and everything, um, that water is now polluted with industrial waste as well as human waste coming from there. Now, the people's farm, they sold their land, even their farmland, they can't go there anymore. They can't fetch water. They can't fetch wood. But when we went there and spoke to them and made them understand that they can do something about it, they just sent a letter to us two weeks ago that they went to their local council and now the local council went to the, to the distillery farm and they have removed whatever they had done to let the water stay and be clean so that they can drink the water. Now, that is not the optimum outcome, but that's the beginning. And this is what we are looking for. Now, money could come, and we wish we could get a lot of money from the people. But we know for sure, someone who gives you money doesn't necessarily want you to make his power uncomfortable. That is a proven fact. If we get that, that will be obvious. That will be awesome. But if we can get people to hold their countries responsible, we can change the structures that may keep people in poverty. And if we do that, Africa can engage the United States in a manner in which we can actually dictate the terms. But first, we have to empower the people. And this is where AFGN's philosophy has always been. And I hope you answered some of your questions. Thank you. Maybe if I just say something also on that, I um, I know it's not money, but I also know that uh, in Nigeria, some of the bishop has bought the idea of what sisters are doing, like uh, the Archbishop of Benin. Every program we had had in uh, in Benin, the bishop gives us the the diocesan bus and said to use, so that saves us money from the you know paying for hiring of bus. So I think the more we get engaged and become more visible in Africa, maybe. But also, if you know the business people that, you know, that will be interested, I think it will be good to let us know. Then we can also approach them with what we are doing further. I think this is part of the conversation we are having right now. If you happen to know good addresses, so please share them with us. I believe that, uh, as uh, Dr. Steve said, this is organic. Really, AFGN has been impactful. I remember in 2015, when we organized the big continental conference on land grab, we had 116 different organizations that participated. The whole continent was represented. United States, this continent, Asia, to see, to pull together all the leaders who are decision makers, especially traditional African religion, to understand the, under, I mean, the, the worldview in terms of land, how land is seen traditionally. Usually land is for the community. If you don't need it, it goes back to the community. We're discussing the philosophy behind land, which you don't own land, it belongs to the community. So these are issues we discuss, and there was a very good conversation that we could really have because Muslim, Christian, traditional 
uh, religion gave us their views on how to handle that. Now, this is the eighth year. 2025 will be 10 years. Are we going to call another conversation? Especially that Africa is now changing. A lot is happening on the continent. Maybe it's, it's time for us to think where we are at. Is it good for us today to convene another conversation? Broader, bringing women contribution, youth, so that Africa may be able to express herself. I use her, Africa's mother, and how we can be able to leverage the space we have going forward. Just a challenge. I hope it's something that we can take at heart as we get ready to go to celebrate our 50th anniversary because land is key for the future. I just rise to uh, stand and bow before the presenters on this moment. Um, I, it's really amazing to know what you are doing to not just lift your voices, but to change systems and to speak to advocacy, which as Dr. Stephen has already said, is some of the hardest work you can do. You're literally putting your life on the line in many ways. And I think many of us really appreciate and understand that. So mine is first a testimony to say, thank you. Just thank you from the ecumenical family that I represent. The second question I have, my first question, though, related to my profound appreciation for, of course, AFJN, but what I've heard just now is I'm curious to know how you're working ecumenically and across interfaith lines as well to accomplish the admirable goals that have been met and how you envision your future going forward. But first and foremost, thank you, thank you, and God bless you. Sister Lily, then yes, can I say, how are we okay. involving all that people of different faith? Thank you very much. Um, in the case of Uganda, we work with Uganda Joint Christian Council. That is one body which brings all the Christian faith together and uh, they're involved in our activities. And then um, the second one is the interdenominational approach, which is under interreligious council. Because uh, when it comes to advocacy, we realize that the problem touch, it touches everyone, regardless of religion, regardless of denomination. So most of these problems bring people together. That is my observation. And we have been observing that. Thank you. Sister Benny, and um, do you have anything to say? Or Emmanuel? Um, okay. Um, thank you once more. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, during our last advocacy campaign that we had here in George province, it actually involved youth, particularly from different uh, across denominations. In fact, the last group, the last advocacy campaign that we had that I said it was interdenominational involved um, we as AFJ and youth. Then we also had CAN, Youth CAN. We have, we call it a CAN, Christian Association of Nigeria. So the youth arm of CAM, of CAN in just, in just province. And then we also had also JNI, we call it uh, in full, it's called Jama'atul Nasr Islam. So it's an umbrella body of the Islamic, um, of, of the Islamic Ummah or the Muslims. So we had them involved in our last advocacy campaign, particularly when we discussed the issue of um, early child marriage and domestic servitude. And then parts of uh, human trafficking, uh, partially human trafficking also. So for us as youths, we understand the importance of this synergy. Um, as like I, like I mentioned 
earlier that the issues affecting these issues cuts uh, they are go they go beyond religious lines they go beyond ethnic or cultural lines and then affects affects us all as a people and then even the youth club that we are taking of that we are we are we are, we are talking of um, trying to establish to continue the same partnership involves not only the Christian youth or AFJ and youth or youth or can can youth that's Christian youth but it also cuts across religious lines and it's going to involve also the youth from the JNI, the Islamic body of um, of uh, that's the umbrella body of the Muslims. So for us as young people, particularly in this region, we also we understand the importance of this ecumenism or, or, or interfaith uh, dialogue, and we are involving that also in our advocacy. We've been doing that, and then we'll continue to do that through your support, and then by the grace of God, God helping us too. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think Emmanuel has said most of what I wanted to say, but I need to say something about funding of AJ. Can I just make a comment? Hello? Go on. Go on. Go on. I think she's... Okay. I'm just emphasizing a point you made earlier. And what uh, I personally have learned watching your career and energy, I see that the main funding that I give So it's not everyone. That it is, it's not everyone that will be interested, that people will be conscientized, people will open their mind to know what is happening. And they are more willing to fund projects that are about doing things than, uh, that, than about advocacy and consciousness awareness. So we have to accept that as part of the challenge. I don't want to use the word limitation, but part of the challenges that FJN will have to face. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So for me, within my uh, catchment area, well, regardless of the religious background, we, I mean, we evolve everyone once it's an issue that concerns other people. Everyone is involved. So during the engagement with um, AFJN, we make sure that everyone of, I mean, the religious uh, authorities were equally involved in the issue so that we make it like it concerns everybody. There's not, no one is taken out so that at the end of the day, the education goes to every corner within the locality. Thank you. Uh, Madam Massa, can you talk about uh, the interreligious aspect of our work for the coming month? Yes, I wanted just to share the experience of interreligious here, as, uh, here in Cameroon. We have many, many uh, uh, churches and many religious is there. In the West region in particularly, but in the whole Cameroon, we have Muslim, we have Presbyterian and Catholic and those who are traditional uh, faiths. We are working with all of them in the issue of birth certificate because uh, in the part of Nun division who is more Muslim, they don't even know the importance of birth certificate. So as a Christian, we cannot say that we cannot, we will not work with the Muslim, no. Since 2019, that we start with this a council, a mobile council, a mobile council. We are working more with the Muslim than the Christian because in that area is they are Muslim, uh, 80%. That is why for us, working with the population, we include all the population without make the the medical considering the fact that they are you are Catholic or you are Muslim or you are not a Christian or you don't have a faith Christian, but we are working with all of them. 
that is why I wanted to share because even in the prison, we are working with all of them. And in the schools, in the health centers, it's more Muslim in the moon division who are there and we are working with each of them. Thank you. Just, um, just to say that anytime we have a workshop, we always invite, yeah, it's true that the sisters are the target. But whenever we invite stakeholders, the stakeholders are always mixed. But one word we are, I always use is Africa Faith and Justice Network. We all are Africans. We all have, you know, a belief. We all like network. So if you have these attributes, you are a member of AFJN. And that really attracts everybody to be active because nobody there will say, I am not an African. So that, that name, and they also tell us the name is really very, very good because the name doesn't say you are Catholic, you are Muslim, you are this. They always say, we are African, we are Nigeria, we are this. Therefore, we are included. So the name makes it very, very inclusive of everybody. And that's why, they, I mean, my experience is that they love this organization. That sometimes they will say, where have you been? Where have you been? Why are you just coming to Africa now? So that's also is helping us to expand beyond just Catholics. Yeah, Sister Ignatia is the actually coordinator for um, AFJN in Ghana. It's just because of time that she was not given the platform to speak, but she has it now. So, Ignatia. Yeah, congratulations to AFJN for the 40th anniversary, and thank you for the good work being done, especially in Ghana. Yes, we have been working with Bahati and with Sister Ikeria. And on this last question that I would like also to say later, our last workshop was not only for sisters, but as Sister Eukarya said, for what? many people, especially the youth, that included Christian, Muslims, and even traditionalists were among. And together, we formed a team going out on our journey, entering the communities, which makes it very, very strong. When we go to, mostly we are in the com uh, Muslim communities. And so the Muslims are able to explain, even before we go, they are able to tell us some of the things that uh, affect whatever we are going to do. At the moment, we are working on early child and forced marriages in the North. And it's very prevalent in uh, Northern Ghana. We have entered so far eight communities and is working very much. There's so much positive change. The people are accepting it. Even a community, some of the communities are there that you will not find even a single Christian. Others, there are uh, Christian churches and other uh, traditional leaders or people, but they all accept because the group that or the team Sisters, the youth from the Catholic Church with other Christian denominational and uh, de denominations and Muslims go together and it makes it strong. So with this, I think we are able to touch every religion and it makes them feel comfortable that maybe I'm not alone. The Christians are not coming to impose something on us. And as we said, we are we were able, even the last time, to meet the chief or a regional chief imam with all the imams in their central mosque in the northern region. And it was a very wonderful meeting with them. So that they to from there will take their message in their various mosques to the people about early child and forced marriages in the north. So there's collaboration. 
with other religions and it helps a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think this is a great segue. Can we please give a big hand to our panelists and to those online and to everyone who asked the question? 